And the main question is, how can we come, uh, should we, and how can we come to a future model of economy that is not exploitive and not uh, abusing in the first place? How can we, if we should, how can we rearrange this on a political level, on an economical level, on an organizational development level, on a professional training level? Yeah. So that's 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 really very interesting, and I. The good news is that I don't know where to start. So that. Um, so let me start in a, in a in a weird place. Let's start with this. Um, my take on oppression. And um, my take on on blame. It's really interesting. For so let's take the current crisis. It's really interesting the lightning rod on which the blame went. So for example, in Europe, the blame didn't go to national states. The blame didn't go to trade unions. This often happens. Mm -hmm. uh, the blame went uh, into European organization, mm -hmm. which, is, which seems very natural to us, but it's completely strange because in America, this did not happen. Nobody's blaming the United States of America or the common currency dollar. Mm -hmm. This does not happen in China. This does not happen in, in Japan. On the contrary, it made, um, even here, we are afraid of China. Why are we not afraid of, 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 of Singapore? Or why are we not afraid of South Korea? Mm -hmm. Why are we not afraid of Japan? Well, we are afraid of China because they're big. And what is our European reaction? Well, let's... let's no, but our problem is here that we, we, we want to dismantle the European Union. You know? So with a threat of, let's say, big China, our reaction is, well, let's, let's break down the organization for, for, of, of 50 years. So that to me is, last point. Uh, uh, when com confronted with the yeah. Chinese threat, which I don't share, but yeah. very many people do, yeah. um, uh, our reaction is, let's, let's dismantle Europe, let's, let's, let's get rid of Euro, let's, 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 make our, let's, make, let's go back to na nation states. Ah, okay. instead, of, instead of, well, you know, we have these big behemoths against us, we should also be united, mm -hmm. our reaction mm -hmm. was exactly the opposite. So that's, that's my first point. Which leads me to my second question. To what degree can we blame capitalism for alienation or exploitation? So we must immediately uh, think of the historical predecessors of capitalism and whether they have been more or less exploitive of, of other people. Because if we find out that capitalism is more exploitive than the systems that we had in the past, then we have trouble. Uh, if we, uh, if we uh, have, however, would find that the current system, whatever we call it, European capitalism or Western capitalism, or I don't know, it's not really capitalism, it's somewhere between capitalism and Marxism, I would even say. Uh, one way how to measure this is the percentage of taxes. If half of your taxes go through the, the common hand of the government, where you vote uh, politically rather than economically, then you could argue that our system is half free market. With half of your money you can do whatever you want, but the rest of the money... So in Europe you do not have a choice when it comes to health insurance. You are insured and you cannot exit. You can also look that look at that central health system in many countries is in a way sort of the big basic idea is not capitalist but it's somehow communitarian or even maybe communist because there you don't pay for your individual health you have an insurance mm -hmm. and we tend to and if you look at the structure of the economy there are many areas in which we do not allow the markets to enter so to speak so I have a choice of a restaurant. To, to, to eat, and I judge that according to the quality and price. Um, but then, in the most more serious issues, this idea of capitalism get, goes away, and even today, in the, in the society, 2014, we would have what I would call communist, or communitarian rather, because the communist has a negative, negative uh, sound to it, which is, I think, good, after the experience that we went through. So, for example, pension system, 
uh, in many countries is majority of that is sort of communitarian. You know, what, what you earn in your pensions is independent, largely independent of your contribution. So you contribute some quite a large percentage of your income and everybody, you put it into a common pool and everybody sort of pulls out of that. Car insurance also. Um, if I drive my car, my old Skoda into your new uh, Mercedes-Benz and I create a damage of 10 million, oh sorry, 10 or 20,000 euros, I don't pay a common insurance pace. So this is also one reason why we, this is, this is, this is an interesting, one can go deeper into it. But what happens is that uh, even though it is my fault and I should pay, this is not happening. There is a substituting institution, mm -hmm. again, communitarian, in which I pay regular contribution and then, irrespectively of my personal responsibility, you get your, you get your money. So what is my point? My point is that these systems of, of let's say, capitalism and communitarianism is, are embedded into each other. Mm -hmm. One could even go as far as to say that they wouldn't function in their pure form. This, I think, is the lesson that we unfortunately had to learn from, from communism, is that uh, even communism didn't manage to work in its own self. So, perhaps we now come to the two sort of bearings in human being, which exploit each other also. So psychologically, I would be interested in your opinion here, you have described oppression as something that is external, and that is here because of the system, that you oppress me, or I oppress you. But couldn't it be also useful to have a look at oppression from a purely um, internal um, psychology sort of a point? So there are, let's say, tough elements in me, let's call them, I don't know, for, for lack of a better word, let's just call them rational or even maybe economic or, or sort of market oriented, that exploit the soft part of me. So this is the stupid cliche that you see almost in every movie. The father is blamed or he blames himself. His career disallows him to spend time with his children. Yeah, this, 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 this. So in other words, his work oppresses him to uh, not be able to, to be as free or be himself. So that's one way, this is perhaps a classical way of looking at it. My contribution is that this oppression often leads not to negative, but to positive result, and even further point, to positive. And this is, for me, the danger. So this may be also interesting in what you were saying, is that um, two points. Firstly, when we think about this work hard, play hard. So if there is are these two elements in human, let's say, psyche or nature. Uh, I work too hard and then I play too hard. In other words, I will never meet myself because I, yeah. I have to have boredom of excessive nature, which then swings the pendulum into, which something that Czech philosopher Jan Patochka calls the need for orgasticity. Yeah, so I... So that's one point. Uh, and this extremely, so for example, I work too much, I create an internal blame mechanism, how much this is external and internal of course can be debated, but I don't need anybody else to oppress me, I'm fine in oppressing myself. And then I push myself into uh, spoiling my kid. So I come home and I never have normal time with my child, I will have excessive time with my child. So I take him to you know, this, I buy him everything that, that he needs. This, in a way, is how I read our current crisis. That we, that our problem, this I think you know, I will repeat this very often, that our problem is that the economy is not depressed, but it's manic depressed. Mm -hmm. And this sort of, this sort of um, manias, I consider to be more dangerous than, uh, than, 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 than these depressions. So that's my one point. And my second point is I have been, I've been reading, I've been reading uh, mythology exactly with this one agenda in mind to find whether human beings can at least theoretically in their fantasy space build a society that would be non-oppressive.
Mm -hmm. Because this to me is important. If we can im imagine it in theory, then maybe we can imagine it in practice. If we cannot imagine it in theory, mm -hmm. then there is something wrong with our imagination. But um, this would be a serious dent in, in, in this idea of, of an ideal society, if we cannot even fantasize it. So I go through all sorts of myths about an ideal society. So there are, of course, two. One is the you know, golden age, illo tempore, um, freshly after creation. In most myths, there was a harmonious society um, before the entrance of technology, before the entrance of, of, of growth, before the entrance of money and, and economics. It was a natural state. You can find in almost every belief. Uh, <clears throat> then, uh, towards the end, you know, then we have uh, heaven and we have the stationary state in economics, etc., etc., etc. What interested me most is this, is this myth of Lilith. Lilith is a fiction, well, of course, mythical character, a woman that was created before Eve. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, from your standing point, you can already read the creation of Eve as being the beginning of oppression because Eve was created to be Adam's helper. Mm -hmm. So you could see that Adam was positioned in creation above Eve. Eve was second and Eve was a result of Adam feeling lonely, so God gives him a, 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 a suitable helper. Mm -hmm. So there already there is a little bit of oppression. But there comes the interesting part about Lilith. Lilith <coughs> is a woman that was, according to Hebrew mythology, created together with Eve, uh, sorry, together with Adam before Eve. Mm -hmm. And they were created equal. Mm -hmm. However, um, Lilith finds being in the state of paradise unbearable because uh, she didn't enjoy, and this is a little bit funny, we don't know why this is so, she did not enjoy sleeping, ha having a sexual intercourse, lying under Adam, the mm -hmm. classical sort of sexual position. She did not enjoy that. She wanted to be on top. Mm -hmm. Because of this, I would say detail, uh, she leaves paradise, so God sends angels to fetch her back and she says, no, 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 I will never go back and submit myself to, to Adam. And they say, no, if you don't come back, we will curse you with a terrible curse. You will have to have, give birth to 100 children a day and, and you have to eat your 100 children a day every day if you don't come back. And she rather chooses this uh, you know, sort of uh, approach, I would rather do this than be subject mm -hmm. to Adam. So there your topic of oppression comes in, in, in sort of, I think, an interesting spin. Because the way I read the story is that even in a situation of no oppression at all, even before banks, money, capitalism, religion, sexual um, differences or, or, or whatever, uh, people will find symbolic symbols of oppression. So mm -hmm. today, this is not a big problem, how the, the sexual position, or it's something that is easily solved. Uh, but for Lilith, it became, she, she, I mean, if you ask me, she blew it out of proportion. I mean, for this small little tiny wee bit, that an average sexual counselor could solve in five minutes, she finds this to be, to be too oppressive. Uh, my, my second point to this is that, this is, as you find in, in mythologies very frequently, there is a very mighty creator, God, a deity that creates the whole world, the quantum structure and, and the everything alive. Mm -hmm. Extremely uh, complex task. And then suddenly <clears throat> there comes a small little problem that he cannot solve, namely sexual positions. I mean, God who can do anything suddenly now cannot convince this woman, Lilith. So God who is omni-powerful cannot solve this problem. Why? Because it's symbolic. So, my point. Uh, uh, even in a context <coughs> or organization where there is no hint of oppression at all, 
human beings will immediately find the smallest little tiny details, whose hair is longer, whose, I don't know what, mm -hmm. feet are larger, <coughs> and create structures which uh, then will lead for the people feeling oppressed by the other. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not only an individual question, because uh, if, uh, if, if you build up a good culture, uh, uh, you, you cut these uh, devil circles. Because if you do not expect that another person will exploit you, you don't have, uh, you have, don't have the need defense for a uh, defensive exploitation to, make, to be sh safe. Yes. So, you become generous and you invite the generosity of yes. others. Yes. You invite uh, that people uh, do not try to make them bigger than they are. Yeah. Uh, you you uh, cut down systems that seduce people into non-humanistic ways of living, yeah. which are the background and cause this uh, crazy exploitation and the crazy, uh, what says, um, Waste, waste of energy, of resources, and all these things. Obviously, not making peop people happier or, or, or supporting their real welfare. And uh, besides the question of distribution, so I have some really, and it's, it's not so ideal. I do not expect that everybody's yep. happy with that. But yep. it's, but it's, it's simple to what what should be better, and, and many people would agree. The question is how to get there. Yeah. This uh, thing is, is, is precisely <coughs> what I call a fetish. Mm -hmm. you, th uh, you think you need it, yeah. but in fact it destroys you. Yes. So, for example, this idea of growth that you talk about, yeah. we today mean growth economically. But uh, for people in the medieval times, this is something that we talked on the way here, it was very important that the church growth, which today to us, you know, people would fight wars, and we should be really careful <coughs> not to call this stupid reason, even I'm very close to it. They would fight each other over how babies should be baptized. Yeah. Today, pff, nobody cares and I'm never going to force you to, to, to baptize your child in, in, in my way or okay. even... But they would really literally kill each other. They would yeah. chop off each other's heads because of a mm. belief that we today find ridiculous. Yes. Un well, unimportant. To them it was very important, to us it's important, but not to the point that I would wage a war. Or Interestingly also, I think even a better example, so what I'm doing now is I'm describing past fetishes. Fetishes mm -hmm. that people yeah. die for, yeah. which today we laugh at. Yes. Um, in Europe, two generations ago, half of the countries had this fetish of growth geographically. Mm -hmm. Again, something that we laugh about today. If, yes. if Poland came to Czech Republic and said, do you want half of Poland? Mm -hmm. We would probably say, no, why? I mean, we have we enough of our own <laughs> problems. Um, uh, but, and today we laugh about it, thank God. Three gen two generations ago, yes. we would literally kill each other. We today don't understand why was it so important? Why did we feel inadequate if we were small? Why did we feel defenseless mm -hmm. if we were sl small? Mm -hmm. um, because of geography. So today, again, this is a second fetish, and I could name, of course, a couple of more, that has, that has gone. So in other words, nobody feels more secure if his na land is geographically larger. Now, the fetish of today, I would say, is economics. We no longer grow geographically. Nobody cares about that. We grow economically. And here you can even see, and I'm adding to your point here, that what you measure determines how you think. Because GDP, this is, this is, this is your, I take this from... Photosocial product. Yes, I take it from, from your German brilliant um, thinker and sociologist Ulrich Beck. Mm -hmm. uh, we measure GDP in national terms. So, of course, we could measure GDP according to, I don't know, males, females, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. And there the dividing line then would become males and females because today we look at GDP of Greece versus GDP of Germany. 
and immediately the old nationalist debate comes back, which you saw two years ago, mm -hmm. remnants of Second World War came up in this debate. Why? Because we still measure GDP nationally. If we measure GDP regionally, which is of course the same thing, only the measurement differs, some regions of Greece would be helping some regions in especially East Germany. Mm -hmm. And this discourse would disappear. Um, and there would be a different discourse, there would be a regional discourse. So my point is that even even GDP, which appears to be a very hard, exact fact, isn't hard, exact sure. fact, is only something that we got used to. But more importantly, it is impossible to come up with a neutral measuring rod. The moment you start measuring something up against something, that's where your division, that's where your skirmish lines will be. Um, so that's, um, that's to the point of how do you actually organize your mental, your mental structure in uh, where do you draw the dividing lines. Mm -hmm. So just, just to conclude, all these three fetishes that I have named have something in common and that is that we believe in them too much, very much, too much even, I would say. Um, uh, and while they looked essential to our existence, they really almost destroyed us. Mm -hmm. Religious wars almost destroyed religion, understandably for many people. Yeah. Um, uh, national wars destroyed nations, that's why right. we have the European Union. This yeah. is the answer to... And then nationalism is one of the biggest threats today, we are afraid of going yeah. back. And man, many sciences destroyed wisdom. Exactly, <laughs> yes, and many sciences dis dis destroy. And you have, of course, these horror movies where Frankenstein is sort of, you know, this crazy, crazy. Mm -hmm. So maybe, the, and the same thing, a little bit, happened with economics in 2008. Yeah. It was not the Chinese yeah. competition. It was not ecological problem. It was not that we ran out of resources. It came so from within the heart of the system. So the dynamic of this fetishistic yes. dynamic. Yes, it, yes, exactly. It's, it's a fetishist yeah. dynamic.